ACC Media Days are now done, but did we feel any better about the state of the conference afterwards? I'll let you decide we go over Commissioner Phillips' comments. More importantly, we're going to talk about the Atlantic and the Coastal teams and what did we learn from them, what do we feel better about, what did they just say that everyone says that makes you say, huh, okay? We're also going to talk about a little bit of fresh kick game from those uh, Cavaliers. Why not? Let's do it. Locked on ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's edition of Locked On ACC. I'm your host, Candace Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me today. You can catch a show up to five days a week, every single day for up to 30 minutes, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. If you have not yet, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at Candace. Not Candace at Locked On ACC. You can follow me personally at Candace D Cooper that you see on the screen if you're watching the YouTube channel. Got a lot to go over today. We've got a lot of good things from ACC Media Days to discuss, but I got to start with the the hard stuff, right? Let's get that out of the way. Commissioner Phillips, one of the most interesting commissioner forums that we've seen thus far in the media kit. I guess is a roundup of all of the conferences. We knew. Going into this bad boy that Commissioner Phillips is going to have to give us some reassurance or something to let us know that the conference was in good hands. But as he began to speak, you could just tell it was going to be the same old same. Conversations are still happening. A lot up in the air. Everything is on the table, right? And I'm like, okay, fine. Everything is on the table. Shout out to Joe Giglio, the host of 99.9 The Fan out here in Raleigh, our ESPN affiliate, who asked one of the better questions for Commissioner Phillips saying, pretty much, let's cut the ish. Like, we understand, you know, morality-wise, ACC is a cut above. We know that, you know, academics is very much a priority. We understand that ultimately we want to do right by our student athletes. But as it stands, we are getting lapped from a revenue standpoint. So what can we do to ensure that the ACC is still around five years from now? And, you know, Commissioner Phillips cut it plain, basically, that, listen, I'm not on some Pollyanna vibes. I'm not trying to tell you that, you know, everything's going to be hunky-dory and all good to go, but very much hammering home the point about the grant of rights and the penalties, the nine-figure penalty plus some others, you know, probably interest, right, that some teams would have to pay if they decided to leave. So, to me, he's basically saying, leave if you want to. <laughs> Think that things are going to happen better for you if you do, don't really suggest it, right? Not probably in your best interest. And as much as we're all talking about the horrible TV deal that he inherited, let's be clear, you know, we didn't have Commissioner Phillips sign the ink on the dot line with the ESPN contract. So this is not his fault. He's just trying to deal with the mess. Perfect example for this is Maryland. A lot of people, if you watch our show, Kenton Gibbs, a Locked on Wolfpack especially, has brought up the conversation about the Maryland Terrapins. They were the one team, the staple team, part of the Atlantic Coast Conference to decide to shift to the Big Ten. And let's just be frank, how many big games have you seen Maryland in since? Not saying that, you know, their programs don't have some good swimming, not even swimming, tennis teams, lacrosse teams. Things of that nature. But when it comes to football and basketball, the things that everyone keeps saying is the main stakeholders in all of these conversations. Where have you seen Maryland? And for me, that would be my biggest red flag for any school, Florida State, Miami, North Carolina, who might be thinking about venturing off into the unknown or going to the SEC or the Big Ten. Now, I will also say, you know, at the end of the day, it was very interesting that nobody really touched that question only to Commissioner Phillips, right? That was one that he had to answer many a times, trying to get more clarity on his thoughts there. But you didn't really see anyone ask that of the coaches or the student athletes. Pretty much just let it go, right? Because what can they do? They know it's above their pay grade in so many regards. The biggest thing for coaches and athletes, mainly for coaches, was about getting rid of the divisions, going to the 355 model, which cool question now, but let's just focus on what we have in front of us, which is still very much two divisions. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Atlantic teams and the coastal teams. What was the highs, the lows, some of the confusing parts, and all that's in between. So let's start 
But day one, right? You got your Atlantic division. You know, you felt like good. It's good to see everybody. The shout out to everybody who came up to me, said they listened to Locked On ACC podcast. It was very reassuring to know that things are going the right way and made me feel good about all these many episodes <laughs> that I have to do. So appreciate all of the feedback and all of the follows and all of that good stuff. Make sure you say, hey, Again, my name is on the ticker here at Candace D. Cooper if you want to follow on Twitter and have that conversation. So day one, we got the Atlantic in there. After Commissioner Phillips spe- spoke, we said, oh, Coach Norvell, get on that stage. And let me tell you something, Florida State, for all my Seminole fans listening, y'all know y'all get on me about my candor towards the Knowles and how much y'all are very passionate about your team. And you know, after listening to Norvell, I understand the frustration. I, I can sense it now. I can feel the angst or the annoyedness, that's a word, <laughs> about him. Only because I always say this about the Carolina Panthers head coach. I think that when you talk too fast, <laughs> Matt Rule, it ends up being like, okay, are you telling a lie? I always say this about men. Any man who talks a little too fast, speeds up the words, it's like, okay, what part do you want me to miss – you know, miss out on <laughs> because you're telling a tale. I think Mike Norvell was nervous or just, you know, this is not his thing. And not everybody's a public speaker, right? I My coach is Mac Brown. He does it. He did this before he went back into coaching. Loves to be behind the mic. Mike Norvell doesn't love to be behind the mic because I think so many times people feel like they're going to try and get, media is going to try and get you in that gotcha question. And you could just tell he just didn't want to get got. <laughs> everything that he was saying, he just wanted to make sure that he didn't say anything wrong or have any misle- misleading, you know, innuendos or s- sentences that were going to make Noel fans go crazy. So he kept it plain. He talked about the schedule and the structure and how the team is adjusting to new things. But more importantly, they're excited to get going. This is the year where, you know, Mike Norvell knows what's up. Like he's not unfamiliar with the media world, the comments from his fans. I know he doesn't read message boards, I'm sure, but he's not unfamiliar with the the tense few years that he's had during his tenure at Florida State. But now he's got a great leader in Jordan Travis. First year that he didn't have to come with multiple quarterbacks figuring out who he was in his identity. Gave credit to Mackenzie Milton and Blackwell for you know, kind of giving him that pathway to be a good leader. But this is his team now. If nothing else, Jordan Travis has all the confidence in the world. He harped on his hard journey that was coming to NC, NC State, Lord, Florida State. There it is. Got NC State on the brand. I'm ready to talk about them. Can you tell? He talked about his hard journey. He talked about how difficult it was you know, to get to this point. But now he's ready. And I'm saying, as someone who's seen witness him have very good flashes, shout out to the Florida State Carolina games the past two years, I'm not saying he can't do it and he can't deliver. I think – what Florida State fans want and what he's capable of may not co-align. However, it's going to be a long season. A lot of good games happening in front of them. They're going to have to give me something. You also heard from Fabian Lovett, who I think is you know the next Jermaine Johnson, who has a lot to give to the program, and hopefully he can be and on the spotlight, the same way Johnson was last season. And he talked about his dominant approach to the game, wearing number zero. He's likes to scare offensive line. He feels good about it when he goes up to them and feels like they're shaking in their boots. He wanted to reemphasize how much that the defense was locked into the def- details this season. Defense, Defensive details. Say that four times fast, okay? Locked into the details, making sure they were good to go. And he gave all the praise to Jamie Robinson, the transfer from South Carolina, who he said immediately, he's a dog. He's ready to go. We know, you know those are all the colloquial terms that you talk about really good players going into the season. And when asked about what it, what's in him to make him so great, he said it was just in him, Jamie Robinson. He's just ready to play. I think, if, if anything, with that peach, we'll call it peach soup that he was rocking. Very nice, by the way. You know, I think he just has all the confidence in the world, and he's just ready to get out there and show Florida State fans what he could do. So if I walked away from the conversations, I would feel good about Florida State saying, listen, they might not be the top of the top, top talk for who's going to be the champions out of the Atlantic, but hell, you've got all of the horses in the stable to be great. Hopefully they just align well with some of the X's and O's executed by your head coach. So there was that. It's good to talk here about Wake Forest just a bit. Want to make sure that we don't sleep on our 
Atlantic Division champions. But first, I want to remind you guys that from the people who invented Healthy and Tasty comes the latest gift to your taste buds. You probably tried the Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar, but guess what? Your friends at Built have given Coconut Brownie Chunk the Puffs treatment. That's right, the Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar flavor you love in a deliciously chewy, marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate is ready for you. Stop drooling and just listen. All Built Bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides a ton of health benefits. Eat something that tastes good and is good for you. Delicious coconut rich sweet brownie, creamy marshmallow. You got to stop fantasizing and go to built.com right now. Order your box of coconut brownie chunk puff, built puffs right now using promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your order. Again, using promo code LOCK15. That's L O C K E D 1 5. All right, we're rocking and rolling here. Locked on ACC podcast, host Candace Cooper trying to give you the inside scoop of what happened during media days. Of course, this is going to be a multi-part show because I want to make sure you guys get all that you need from every single school because, of course, you know I know all the fans from around the world are listening, trying to make sure that their team is ready to go for this football season. So you got your defending Atlantic Division champions, Wake Forest, who, you know, Peaky Blinders, I need somebody to help me understand that. I don't get it. I can Google it later on, but I wasn't, you know, it's maybe, maybe it was above my head. Sam Hartman didn't want y'all to talk, call his hat a fedora, but he was rocking it on today on the media day one, and it was looking interesting. But <laughs> come to find, special tidbit about Sam, big time trash talker. Learn, though, that if you talk trash, more than likely they're going to hit you harder. So he's working on that scheme. But you had the sentiment of Michael Jer- Michael Jurgens, who said, I doubt that the trash talk would stop. When you look, think about Sam Hartman, though, and how long he's been with the program, one thing that stuck out about Sam is the leadership that he's trying to give for the younger guys, right? Once you've been there long enough, sometimes it can get a little daunting to have to be the leader constantly or have to step into that main role. But he certainly stepped up to the plate, which was sentiments echoed by Dave Clawson himself. I think Coach Clawson arguably is one of the best coaches in our conference. And just listening to him speak, you can just tell his IQ for the game is top notch. And of course, being at a place like Florida State, I mean, God knows what is going on. Being at a place like Wake Forest, I know Florida State wishes, then it just you know goes hand in hand of what they're trying to do. One of the key things that Wake Forest made sure we emphasize they emphasized going into the day was the fact that they have the horses in the stable on top of being academically gifted. For so long, it was oh Wake Forest has really smart guys, you know, just happen to play football well, and now you go to go to Wake Forest because you are talented on the field and you happen to be academically gifted. So I think they're trying to make the program set up, set the program apart from what their former kind of conversation around them was about. More than that, I think that if you think about Wake Forest, their season last year, how quote unquote special it was, they weren't surprised by how good they could be. I think going into this season, you can't be surprised about how good they're going to be. The return of Donovan Green, who was out from injury last year next to A.T. Perry, that offense is going to be special. But Rondell Bothroyd wanted you guys to know that defensive line is going to be just as good, and he's ready for the matched energy, right? We've seen and talked about how good the offense is for Wake Forest, but you also saw Wake Forest get games where Army put up 50 against them, right? And you've seen the defense struggle mightily against games against Wake Forest and Carolina. So I think the defense has to step up big. The special teams is great. But unfortunately, you know, defense is definitely something you missed last year. And so seeing where the Demon Deacons can go, the red zones, the closing in on making sure that you attack every single drive is going to be very important for them as they make a case for themselves to be the repeating Atlantic Division champions, knowing that other people definitely want to take their spot on top. Now, jumping to Louisville really quickly because I'm rolling through these today. Coach Satterfield, you know, I'll keep it plain. I think he's someone that is very personable, very nice. I ultimately want to see them do well. I think he's done really well from a recruiting standpoint. He's trying to get Louisville to not be so much in the middle of the pack but elevate their program. They have a great football team, right? They have a lot of good guys. Malik Cunningham rocking his men's warehouse suit and his Prada shoes, you know, doing what it do and being compared to – 
Lamar Jackson is something he does not mind at all. I mean, who wouldn't want to be compared to one of the greatest college football players of all time? Like, let's let's keep it real. So Malik is ready to go. I think for me, it's going to be how can Louisville match up against some of the top heavy teams in the Atlantic Division? That's going to be the biggest thing for them, right? They can beat the guys that they know they can beat. They can beat people on paper, their non-conference schedule. I think when you start having the tougher matchups, the ones that are going to be decision makers towards who moves up in the rankings in this last year of divisions, Louisville's got to set the pace and tone a little bit more. I always want to give a shout out, shout out to Dalton Pence, who has been football heavy on his shows. I've been having a great opportunity to listen to his episodes. If you want to check out Locked on Louisville, make sure you do that. Jumping down to NC State, right? NC State, listen, I told y'all this is my team. I'm feeling good about it. Now, first question out the gate, we had a young man who was basically like, hey, coach, <laughs> talking to Dave Dorn. You know, NC State's been through the baseball team got screwed. The basket, women's basketball team got jerked around in U- at UConn. You know, you guys couldn't do your bowl game and all of these bad things. And here goes Coach Doran. Like, listen, you got, you're a really doom and gloom kind of guy, aren't you? Which, you know, not for nothing. Yes, probably so. Let's, let's not err on, let's not overemphasize the negative things that have happened. There was a very good season from NC State football last year. But Coach Doran was definitely trying to harp on the positives. And more importantly than that, he understands what he has in front of him and making sure that we all knew that the accolades in terms of what leadership he, they have on that team. 17 returners. more A good nugget for me that I learned, 10 assistants return. In an era where everyone's trying to get to the next great thing, Everyone wants to keep moving up. Everyone wants to be leveling up, we should say. He had 10 assistants aside to stick around with that program. I think it speaks volumes to the kind of young men that they have and what they're trying to do over there in Raleigh. So as much as we want to sleep on NC State, I implore you not to do so. Corey Durden could have gone to the league and decided to come back for another year. Isaiah Moore coming off of injury, having that humility year to really reignite his passion for the game. Drake Thomas, pretty much his, you know, mel- unmelanated brother saying, I got your back and I'm going to do whatever I can do whatever I can to ensure that this defense stays top notch. I think that Devin Leary is going to have a Heisman level year. Just because he's under the radar doesn't mean he doesn't have the stats to be on the top of his game. So don't sleep on NC State. Only NC State can jack it up for NC State. We know this. <laughs> we absolutely know how this can go. However, I don't think I don't feel that this year for them. I feel like this is going to be a good year for NC State. I want to, I want to, I want this for, for them, you know? I desperately want them to have a good year. I want them to win the Atlantic. They got over the Clemson monkey, the hurdle that was on their back for so long. They've got to beat Wake Forest. Got to. I think one of the things that Dave Doran harped on that was a very good point was with the new 355 model, you get rid of that 110-year tradition, which is going to be so difficult because when I tell you those people in Winston-Salem, those people in Raleigh, very much clash when it's time to get on that gridiron. It's a beautiful rivalry to see and hate that it has to end in that capacity of having that annual tradition. But nevertheless, you know, they will get an opportunity to play each other from time and time again. There, yeah, I think that was the phrase I wanted to get to, but you know what I'm talking about. Either way it goes, I'm excited to see what's to come for NC State. Hear that? Rooting for you. If you unless you know my background, Carolina grad here, I'm very much rooting for NC State. Jumping to Boston College, highlights there. I asked Coach Halfley about year three. Does he feel any pressure? And he's like, hell no. I'm ready to go. I think I have the guys who prepared themselves, who are you know going above and beyond, talking about Phil Dracovic and his journey and playing only one game healthy last year. And to me, as much as I love Coach Halfley and Phil and Zay and all of that, I think that, you know, there's always been something of why they can't excel, right? At some point, we got to just excel. And as much as Halfley owned, he was more defensive-minded his first couple of years and had to grow from an op- uh, offensive space, I think this is the year where I want to see a complete team out of Boston College, whether Phil is healthy or not, right? From a defensive side, you saw you know Josh DeBerry talk about how he pretty much was like, listen, I don't care about the lack of shine. I just want to make it do what it do. Good for him. 
I want to see Boston College defense stand toe to toe and align with that strong offensive unit because we know what Zay Flowers is going to do. Blitnikoff Award watch list. We know he's going to be the man. He speaks volumes of his loyalty towards the Eagles. And I think one of the best games we're probably going to see this year is that red bandana game versus Clemson. And I'm excited personally. Mark that one on the calendar. So if you are a Boston College fan, I think you should be excited. But I think year three is definitely going to be the, okay, well, what is Coach Athley really doing for us around here? All right, so we got a couple more teams to go over for the Atlantic Division. Then we're going to do a part two episode for the Coastal. I want to talk about Syracuse. Now, Dino Baber is my guy. <laughs> we, I laugh because we all know how hard I go for Dino Babers in here. I just want him to do well. I think as an African-American coach in a Power 5 system, like it's, I want you to do well. Now, do I know this is the year that you got to give me something, tell me something good, when every other team in the Atlantic seems that they've progressed in a positive way? It's tough. Like, as much as we get we're, as much high praise I was given to Sean Tucker, I didn't feel that same vote of confidence for Garrett Schrader, right? I understand that he's in his fourth offensive system, and now it's quote unquote tailored to him. Show me something. If you're not following Matthew Bonaparte and the guys over there at Locked on Syracuse, do yourself a favor and do that. They have really great content around Syracuse and have been following this journey. You got new new quarterbacks in the locker room. So it's interesting to me that he brought Garrett Schrader. I'm wondering if he is going to be the starter going into week one. I'm feeling confident that he will be. But will he stay the starter the entire season? That remains to be seen. Other than that, Dino... I want this to be the year for you. Not sure with the improvement of other teams in Atlantic, it will be. You had some tough matchups last year. Can you win in the red zone when it matters, when it's down to the final few plays, and you know it's like a three-game, three-point loss, all of those good things. He got to get over that hump for me. Finally, we ended the day with Clemson. Now, for me, Clemson was the team that, of course, Everyone's in the room. Everyone wants to hear maybe the sound by that Sweeney's going to say. It was very even keel for uh, Dabo Sweeney this se- this season, this year, this media day. I think that he was pretty much just like, listen, been here before, do it again. I'm going to give you guys you know, what you want to hear in terms of, yeah, you say I have 10 wins and I stink and I should be fired. You say that you know DJ Uyunglele is not that great because he had a sophomore slump. And what I found positive was the fact that he reassured his confidence in DJ. I think for so much, of course, he's going to do that, right? Of course, he's not going to say, yeah, well, everything's on the table right in front of the young man. But, you know, as much as talk has been around DJ possibly getting benched mid-year, if he's not having the kind of season that is expected of him, I will say it was nice to hear Dabo talk about how good you know, DJ could be and how understanding that there were mistakes made and having to own those mistakes, but also just owning like being a leader at that level. It's a different beast. (laughs) Everyone talks about, you know, trying to be on that stage and wanting to have those accolades until it's your turn. Now, it ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun. You know, it's one thing to have to start a couple games out of the year. It's a whole other beast to be the starter throughout the season, through the highs and the lows, to not have a great game and have everyone on social media hear about it or have everyone on social media tell you about it. I think that's one thing that DJ had to overcome is like those mental hurdles. So for me, this junior year for DJ, I'm trying to see, can you overcome those mental mistakes on the field? Can you overcome those mental hurdles off of the field? Can you still be reassured that you have what it takes to be successful? One great step that he did, he's lost a good bit of weight, at least 20, 25 pounds. Looks like, I want to say he's not big Cinco, but more like Cinquito, like little little Cinco, right? He's not as as huge as he used to be, but in a good way. His Jesus piece definitely was weighing heavy on his neck, but he was sharp in his brown suit. I think that he has confidence. I think he just has to deliver, and if it doesn't go his way, not get overwhelmed by you know what is to come from the media being media and still feeling like he has the confidence to lead the Clemson Tigers because we all know how hard it is to lead that program at this point. They've set the standard for themselves. Best interview of the day to me, though, went to KJ Henry. The young man certainly had the opportunity to go to the league last year, but said he was challenged by Dabo to pretty much elevate this defensive game. 
felt like it was the right time to stay, just stick around and make sure that he leaves a legacy that he too would be proud of. You know what I mean? He's like three degrees in at this point, only two, but still. He has all the talent in the world to be successful and wants to bring this defense back to top form, especially with the new defensive coordinator. I think for Dabo to also echo the sentiments and confidence of Wes Goodwin was so important in Streeter. I think it's so nice to hear that, you know, they've been waiting their turn and now their time to shine. They take their job very seriously and they're going to do a good job. So will it be a reload and just keep going for Clemson? Damn it. I, I believe so. Everyone should be scared of Clemson because the way no one people have been talking about Clemson as if when you said the standards so much, they start picking you apart. It's, it's giving Alabama, right? <laughs> it's giving Alabama Crimson Tide. Either way it goes, I think that Clemson is definitely in the top of the conversation. I still want NC State to do it, but I can't even be mad if Clemson just goes ahead and reloads in this last Atlantic versus Coastal year. I'm going to give you a part two talking about the Coastal teams, but figured I'd let you guys know about what happened on day one of ACC Media Day. Now, rounding out, I would say, if any themes, the Atlantic Division coaches were very much on board with the 355 model of one division over having to you literally claw at each other trying to get to that top of their specific uh, there it is. Getting on top of the Atlantic, we all know how difficult it's been for years. It's nice to see the divisions go away and their and their from their perspective. So I think the Atlantic teams, they're ready for some change. They're ready to see some things go away. Dave Dorn was the only one who was over not having Wake Forest in that 110-year rivalry for sure. But I personally am excited to see this current Atlantic Division season because I think if you look, if you run the numbers, everyone has positives. Everyone has things they you know lost. Everyone has things they have to work on. But more importantly, everyone has a quarterback who's a very good leader, right? Very strong from a quarterback standpoint. Everyone has a returning quarterback. There's nobody new, no systems to relearn. Nobody has to watch film and hope for the best from their high school year. Like everyone has a quarterback that's good. So that defense, if there was never a year, if there was ever a time for Atlantic Division defense to be elite, this is the year. So so that's probably a nice call to all of our defensive players who are listening and running this back. Got to get in, you better get that hand in the dirt and figure it out because you are going to be made mincemeat if you don't. I think there's so many good quarterbacks in the Atlantic Division. Other than that, though, got a coastal conversation that is coming your way. Make sure you follow at Locked On ACC on Twitter and you can subscribe on YouTube. And if you're that kind of person who's already looking towards draft conversation or you're looking to talk about some of the guys currently in the NFL, you got to find out which NFL stars move the betting lines the most. Starting July 18th, Locked On gives you the 50 most valuable players in the NFL from odds makers at Bet Online. Available July 18th on Locked On NFL wherever you get your podcast and YouTube. For Candace Cooper, hope you have a great day. Until next time.